All right, hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. So was 31,000 the top for Bitcoin in 2023? Well, Rect Capital here posting this, okay? He seems to think it was, and I mean, well, we're gonna see higher highs in 2024. He says the next time we see these prices will be months from now, just after the halving, and he's denoted the halving there in a red box on this chart. Only difference between now and then, in the pre-halving period, Bitcoin could still retrace from here. But after the halving, Bitcoin would break out much higher from current prices. So the halving, guys, if this is your first rodeo, if this is your first bull run, well, many things seem to reoccur in these cycles. If, uh, you know, if you're paying attention and I mean, looking at charts, crypto charts, this is, you know, what I do. You do tend to notice trends and similarities, uh, you know, from previous cycles. Now, the beer flu, if you look over here on the chart, that was a black swan event. So that is most likely not going to happen again. Another event like this. Uh, but the pre-halving, guys, this was similar to what we saw in 2019 when we saw the price of Bitcoin rise uh, in mid-June of 2019, then come back down again if we discount the beer flu. Uh, you know, patterns looking quite similar to what we're seeing today. And then, uh, you know, once the halving occurs, April 2024, after that, that is when we see the bulk of price appreciation, or at least we did in 2020 and 2021. So April 2024, that is what we're eyeing here. And uh, Rect Capital just uh, noticing those trends on the chart too. Right now, we've got XRP trading at about 50.508, 0.509, give or take. Uh, you know, not too much activity on the XRP chart. We did see it slowly grinding upwards and then a, a big move down, uh, followed by an indecisive day, really. XRP pretty much following the trend of the market. Bitcoin right now, if I were to put a new price label on this, Bitcoin is uh, trading at about 26.6. So again, not too much difference with regards to uh, Bitcoin with regards to the rest of the market. Um, and you know, like we're going to probably see some more bearish activity guys before we really see the bulls start to take off. And, uh, you know, it's usually pain, doom, gloom, all that nasty stuff before, uh, we really hit that euphoria phase. So, uh, you know, for my patrons over there at patreon.com slash working money channel, I'm still looking for more pain, uh, if I am to accumulate more cryptocurrencies, but guys, this really is the time. I mean, for anybody really, you don't want to start FOMOing in here or here or here, or even here, you know, thinking you're gonna get another big boost because in a lot of these instances, well, the last three that I've denoted on the chart here, everybody who jumped on the FOMO train, let's say after December 2020, is underwater now. So if you got into crypto in 2021, you are underwater. And, uh, you know, this must have been a very, very painful time for you because all you're probably looking at is your portfolio's value being worth less than what you invested. So again, guys, do not make this mistake. Accumulate when the accumulating is good. And again, you can follow me. See what I'm doing at patreon.com slash working money channel when it comes to my crypto portfolio. More updates are coming in the next couple of weeks. Uh, guys, I also wanted to bring this up. XRPnews.crypto posted this. So Ben Armstrong has uh, apparently given a new forecast for XRP price. He's saying $89.00. Uh, which would represent about a 17,359% surge. I mean, a lot of uh, controversy surrounding Ben Armstrong these days. His uh, Apparently his company uh, kicked him out. And so he's decided to go out on his own. In a recent video, renowned crypto influencer Ben Armstrong discussed intriguing insights into the future of XRP, where the asset potentially trades in significant double digits. Uh, and I mean, I don't know how much of this is him just, uh, you know, really just trying to bring his old fan base uh, to his new YouTube channel or whatever he's doing. I mean, to be honest, I have not looked into this price prediction. I mean, I just look at this and it just, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot going on in his life right now, but, uh, you know, long story short, he's no longer with BitBoy Crypto and that entity. And so, uh, what he's doing now, he's going out on his own and he does have to rebuild his, uh, fan base. So maybe trying to entice them with an XRP prediction. Uh, anyway, for those of you guys interested or uh, for those of you guys who do follow Ben, please do let me know. I remember, uh, you know, at a point in time, he was uh, calling himself the, the uh, he was the self-proclaimed leader of the XRP community or the, uh, what was he calling himself? Something about being the general leader or something like that. People in the XRP community are saying, yeah, not really, buddy. Anyway, um, that's that. I will leave that there. Binance and CEO Ching Peng Zhao have asked the court to dismiss the SEC suit. So with regards to the legal issue of cryptocurrency in the US, another story here surrounding Binance. I feel as though anybody in crypto uh, who has to deal with the US is kind of, uh, you know, dealing with the same kind of pressure over there from Gary Gensler. Uh, so he has said the exchange, they, uh, they filed a joint motion to dismiss the US 
SEC's lawsuit against them. According to the September 21st filing in the United States District Court of Columbia, both Binance Holdings and Chengpeng Zhao claimed that the SEC had overstepped its authority in the lawsuit against them. In the 60-page petition, lawyers for Binance and Zhao accused the SEC of failing to introduce clear guidelines for the sector ahead of its lawsuit against the crypto exchange and, as a result, had imposed its regulatory authority over the crypto sector retroactively. And so here is what he said. It is clear that the SEC's lawsuit has no foundation in the currently enacted securities laws. In attempting to claim regulatory power over the crypto industry, the SEC distorts the text of the securities laws, reading the word contract out of this uh, statutory phrase investment contract. And then they say, uh, and the SEC pursues these novel theories retroactively, seeking to impose liability for sales of crypto assets that occurred as far back as July 2017, before the SEC provided any public guidance concerning cryptocurrency. So, you know, that's the other thing, right? The, <laughs> you can't suck and blow. Why are you just coming out now with, uh, you know, your frameworks and your crypto regs? And uh, But at the same time, you still want to go after these guys for what they did way back then when there was no clear rules of the road. I mean, there's still no real clear rules of the road in the U.S. right now. So it's, I mean, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of shady. Like, you can't do that kind of thing. Governments, I mean, government's going to try to do everything under the sun to try to get us and try to, uh, you know, choke the on and off ramps, especially for cryptocurrency. Who was it? I think it was uh, in Lynn Alden's book. Somebody was commenting. I haven't read it, but uh, somebody was commenting that uh, Lynn Alden was mentioning something about the real threat to crypto and the retail sector in particular is the choking of on and off ramps. And so, you know, Binance, one of the biggest crypto exchanges out there, whether you use it, whether you don't use it, uh, this is a big case because you know, it's going to be about the on and off ramps. It's going to be about it's going to be about how you send your cryptocurrency from one exchange to another and, uh, you know, what you're eventually allowed to do and uh, how you're eventually allowed to trade. And then more importantly, where do you cash out of, you know, because at the end of the day, you're going to need to remove your money from the exchange and get it into your bank account. So an interesting development here with regards to crypto regs in the U.S., Jeremy Hogan even picking up on something funny with regards to the Binance lawsuit. Did you know that the CFTC sued Binance in March, alleging that their stablecoin, the BUSD, is a commodity? And then just three months later, the SEC sued Binance, alleging the BUSD is a security. <laughs> now, if FinCEN files a lawsuit against Binance, alleging B, uh, BUSD is a currency, Binance will have achieved the holy trifecta. So again, just kind of emblematic of how problematic this uh, space is. They can't even get their uh, commodity security definitions straight uh, over there in government. So wanted to thank Jeremy Hogan for posting that. Michael Branch posting this. More news with regards to the CBDC Anti-Surveillance State Act, guys, which I talked about uh, in brief yesterday. Significant development. The House Financial Services Committee has successfully passed the CBDC Anti-Surveillance State Act, a bill to prevent the Federal Reserve from issuing a central bank digital currency. So we had a clip of Tom Emmer discussing that uh, in yesterday's video, highlighting the broad support the bill had garnered. Emmer emphasized that it already enjoys backing from 60 members of Congress. Speaking about the committee's decision, Emmer stressed the importance of halting the issuance of a financial surveillance tool that could undermine the American way of life. He distinguished decentralized cryptocurrencies and CBDCs, describing the latter as a government-controlled programmable form of sovereign currency transacting on the digital ledger maintained by government. And so uh, he's got 60 members, 60 supporting members of this act. And as we heard in yesterday's clip, uh, Tom Emmer does seek to ensure that any digital currency issued by the U.S. remains in the hands of Americans rather than being controlled by the administrative state. So exactly what we want. This bill is getting a lot of traction, uh, a lot of support over there in Congress. So I uh, just figured I'd give you guys that update and uh, let you guys know if we hear something down the road. So I wanted to thank Michael Branch, of course, Jeremy Hogan, and uh, XRP News Crypto just for posting those articles there. Wrath of Kahneman, guys, posted this. Now, I talked about this the other day. Chris Larson went on the record basically, uh, you know, stating how San Francisco is no longer going to be the hub for crypto development in the U.S. There are so many different locations now around the world that are supporting crypto adoption, uh, you know, and, and the U.S. unfortunately is in a position now where they're going to be left behind. So it was set to become the blockchain capital of the world, but lost its status because of the hostile U.S. government policies and regulatory crackdowns. Again, Chris Larson said this a few weeks ago. 
Then he went on to say that London, Singapore, and Dubai are now the bigger hubs for the blockchain industry because the federal government forced operations to move overseas. Uh, he said in an interview, Ripple, which remains based in San Francisco, is the crypto payments company behind the XRP token. Now, the other day, Brad Garlinghouse also said that they are hiring specifically in London, Singapore, and Dubai. So uh, funny that, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, Chris Larson was mentioning these three locations. And then uh, I think it was just yesterday, uh, or was that mainnet, Brad Garlinghouse was saying, yeah, we're on a hiring spree, but... You know, we're not hiring in the U.S. necessarily. We're looking at these other locations, namely London, Singapore, Dubai, to hire more Ripple employees uh, because we want to keep developing. And uh, we realize the United States just isn't that place, uh, at least not now. I mean, that could change at a point in time. But, uh, you know, at this point in time, this is what's happening. They're suing Binance. They're, you know, trying to choke crypto on ramps and off ramps. They're trying to go after cryptocurrencies, you know, everything really under the sun. It really is unfortunate. CBDC is another part of this. It really is unfortunate, but, uh, you know, this is the world we live in. Anyway, wanted to thank the Wrath of Kahneman for, uh, for posting that. And I guess I should say, too, that for the companies that have global ties, like this one, XLM, and their development foundation, they joined the World Economic Forum's Humanitarian and Resilience Investing Initiative. Um, for these types of companies... I think they uh, positioned themselves a long time ago so that they didn't paint themselves in a corner, basically relying just on the United States alone. So, you know, like Ripple, they've already reached out, branched out and partnered with many different foreign uh, companies and foreign banks. Obviously, Ripple has done it uh, at a level uh, that I don't think any other cryptocurrency related company has. But, uh, you know, even XLM at this point in time, this one coming from Mason here, they are now the main blockchain representative, he says here. Together, they're using blockchain for global good. What do you guys think? So this is a statement uh, directly from Stellar's website here. The Stellar Development Foundation joins the WEF's Humanitarian and Resilience Investing Initiative to support most vulnerable communities. Now, I mean, I'm not surprised considering in this June 2021 paper put out by the World Economic Forum, specifically cryptocurrencies, a guide to getting started. Uh, you know, we scroll down here and you can see the list of cryptocurrencies that the WEF specifically uh, whether they support these coins outright, they uh, they definitely see potential for these particular projects. So Algorand on the list, Cardano, Celo, XRP, Solana, and of course the Stellar blockchain. Uh, down here they say about Stellar, Stellar is a global public blockchain network built for interoperability between traditional and digital financial infrastructure, most notably for cross-border payments. Stellar's ledger limit is currently set at 1,000 operations per ledger, with ledgers uh, closing approximately every five seconds. There's a limit of 250 transactions per second. The following resources are available to learn uh, about more scalability on Stellar. So that's, uh, you know, just one of the six cryptocurrencies. Of course, XRP is there and some others uh, that I have been following very, very closely. So they're putting them in this report. Again, this report was from June 2021. But these initiatives take time and these projects are building slowly. They're building outward slowly. And, uh, you know, so when we think about the spec market, and we think about the prices of these coins being so depressed and, you know, considering uh, I'm just going to highlight Algorand here for a second, considering Algorand is on that list, too. We look at the coin price now, guys. And I mean, it's trading just shy of 10 cents. Definitely a very attractive price point for a cryptocurrency that has been outlined by the WEF. The technicals look fantastic. It has dipped down to its March 2020 level, the lowest it's ever seen. It's basing in this supply zone. Uh, you know, from here, from its uh, from the top of the last bull market, it's down. It's still down 96%. So technically, it's looking good. Fundamentally, it's being supported by the WEF. Uh, you know, so again, just another example, guys, of where we're eventually going to see the world going moving on blockchain technology. Now, Ingrid here also posted this. Okay, Klaus Schwab on the way the world is changing, the BRICS alliance, and the countries that are going to have the most influence, not necessarily the biggest economies. An interesting perspective here. Listen to this. It's really multipolar because you have the middle states like Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, um, and of course uh, India, um, uh, exercising great influence on global um, on, uh, on, the, on the global situation. Saudi Arabia thanks to its um, energy reserves, India thanks to the fact that it is the fastest growing economy at the moment. Then you have, uh, I would say, also the industry, industrial powers, 
you could you could argue today that some of the companies like Google, Microsoft, and so on are truly uh, multinational power factors. So it's a very complex world, and it's not a very stable world because we are now witnesses witnessing a kind of dynamic system, which is constantly changing, and. I should also add, by the way, to the power factors, small countries. Yeah. I would argue that um, in the world of tomorrow, it's not the, it's the big fish eating the small fish, but the fast fish eating the slow fish. And so you have countries like Singapore, like um, I would add Switzerland or uh, Israel playing also a a, a essential role in the global system. We have to confront a very um, fra uh, fragmented and I would say to a certain extent turbulent system because those countries compete not only in economic terms, they compete having different values, having different systems. So the world uh, is relatively full of complexities and certainly also uncertainties. Now what we have to do in order um, to stick together is to look at those issues where we have really global interdependence. Where um, if we do not cooperate, we will have a lose-lose situation. So essentially what Klaus Schwab is saying here, and he's right, where is their global dependence? Where do we need to depend on each other as uh, nations, countries, in order to make this work? Well, finance, obviously trade. This is the crux, guys. This is why cryptocurrency, blockchain, DLT, that industry is going to be so big moving forward into this coming decade. I mean, it's already building. And so he said, you know, it's countries, smaller nations. It's going to be the fast fish that eat the slow fish. So not just necessarily uh, big industrial, uh, huge economies. It's going to be the most innovative economies. And so the gateway that's going to help foster, uh, you know, some of these countries uh, for trade or finance is going to be cryptocurrency and DLT technology. So there's the debasing of the U.S. dollar, which we've talked about a lot on this channel, uh, the BRICS nations. More and more people, I think, are opening their eyes to what is happening here. XRP Palm Mom on Twitter posted this. Now, I'm not going to play this clip. It was uh, originally done on TikTok, and I believe there's a copyright music track on here, uh, but I will post it in the description of the video. Here's what XRP Palm Mom noticed on the U.S. debt clock, guys. U.S. debt clock shows new prices and numbers, bricks, gold, and silver. So if you take a look at this, and again, I will link this in the description for you if you guys want to watch it, the dollar supply. And take a look at this, guys. The dollar supply here is actually going down. It's diminishing. Going down or actually going up because it's already in negative territory. So what does that mean? Also, Notice that uh, they're looking at it in terms of dollar to silver ratio and dollar to gold ratio. Zero dollars per ounce, obviously, because we know the U.S. dollar is not pegged to anything other than lies and promises. So when we look at an old version here of the U.S. debt clock, you guys can see, I believe this one was from 2018. Uh, so before the beer flu, before any of, uh, you know, this new economic great reset stuff had been happening, there was none of that there, no dollar diminishing. Uh, it was basically just projecting the numbers based on uh, the current situation at the time. And also take a look over here, guys, look at what they've added, BRICS GDP to gold ratio. Uh, and Stephanie Starr also noticed that BRICS added to the U.S. debt clock here. So a lot of people have been noticing this. Uh, not present on the 2018 debt clock. But here, guys, we're seeing it now, 135047 per ounce. So that's the BRICS GDP to gold ratio. So it's looking very, very interesting. You guys can see here dollar to crypto ratio is still listed on here. But why? Why now the focus on the U.S. dollar supply? I think this is indicating that something will be happening that, uh, you know, this talk of central bank digital currencies and, uh, you know, this controlled demolition as we've been talking about the Great Reset. I mean, we've been talking about it for years now. The fact that the dollar is going to be debased, it's not going to be the same as it was five years ago, whether they do introduce a CBDC and they do peg it to something different. Uh, you know, wh whatever they're telling you, I know, I know government is saying to the people, look, the dollar's not going anywhere. That might be true, technically. However, who's to say that they won't replace the dollar and call the CBDC the dollar and then say, oh yeah, and by the way, 
it's now worth uh, 10 times as little as the dollars in your account. So you have $100,000 in your bank account. Well, now you only have $10,000 in your bank account. Just remove a zero off the end there. And that's what you now have. I mean, that's one way of doing it. All things that make me go, hmm, subjective views here. Also bringing this clip up, Greg Manorino, we should be preparing for the events on the horizon, especially in these uncertain times. One thing is certain, a controlled demolition is underway for the new incoming monetary system. This is deliberate. The, and, and understanding that they are, are working very diligently to bring in a new system. I know there's legislation right now to prevent the Federal Reserve from issuing a central bank digital currency. It's not going to do nothing. The Federal Reserve members are laughing. They're in their back room laughing their rear ends off because what's going to end up happening here is once when the central banks are done bringing this system to its knees and you and I with it, okay, um, our loving, caring politicians, in fact, the same ones that are putting forth this legislation to the Fed to prevent it from issuing a central bank digital currency, they're going to be begging for it on their knees. You understand? Because that's how it's being set up. That's how it's going to play out. This current system cannot be fixed. It's not meant to be fixed. It's on a its pathway to destruction. This is deliberate, and they're going to issue in a new system, period. That's all. I think we're all pretty much on the same page. So according to Manorino, the system is going to bring us to our knees, and we will be begging for a solution. This is how it's been designed. This is maybe why... We're seeing the dollar supply being inconspicuously added to the debt clock. I don't know, just my opinion, but I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.